All right, so now is the time we're going to get into our, uh, the Word of God this morning and allow God to speak to us. And so if you have a Bible, open up with me. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab a Bible on these tables. They're yours to take, or we do have it on the screen. I'm going to get to it later, but just so we're ready to read it, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. Acts 2, 42 through 47 is specifically a section of scripture we're going to touch on. And so if you can open up with me, um, we're going to get to that later. So we're not going to read it right yet. But we are in week two of a new sermon series. If you were here last week, you would have been here for week one. And this series for these eight weeks, uh, pretty much April and May, we are recalling what is most important to us as a church. We're calling this series, This is Reality, like what we're all about. Last week, if you were here, it was kind of a fun, a little bit different Sunday, but we kind of retool, retold our origin story, how we became to, to be a church, where our family of churches are, how God called us, and really kind of recapped up until this point what God has done. And I hope it was an encouraging and fun time to see all the ways that God has like poured into this church and really led us in all that we've done. And it's been awesome and incredible. And today we're going to continue on. We're going to continue on in week two. And specifically, we're going to talk about why the church gathers. What does scripture have to say? Like, why is it that we gather as a church? Why can't we just do Christianity on our own? Sometimes it feels like it would be a lot easier, but we're going to talk about, like, look at Scripture and, and see God's design in it, and then also why we do what we do here at Reality, hopefully in line and it echoing what Scripture shows us a picture of what to do. And so let me go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into it. God, thank you for this series that we're in, and thank you for the ability to have your word that guides us directs us. We are so not in the dark. We, it's very clear. God, your word has been preserved for us to look at, and it is so clear that from the very beginning, you meant for us not to be alone, but rather actually heavily involved with each other's lives in community as we attempt to follow the way of Jesus. Community and togetherness and gatherings, large and small, is at the heartbeat of who you are. You are a relational God, and your word is full of relationships. And God, your desire for us as a church is to be your people gathered with your presence and your power in your midst. So God, we just pray that we'd be reminded of that through your word. And as your word comes out, God, we want to receive it. We want to, like grow because of it. We want to change. We want to be more committed to loving and serving each other in community as we follow you than ever before. Help us to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd be the first to admit church, when I say church, I mean like the local expression, any local expression of God's big C church. Right, right now on a Sunday, there's probably hundreds of churches, Bible-believing churches, meeting on island, and even more in the state, and obviously around the whole world. And I'm the first to admit, church is a beautiful thing. But also, it's really complicated, and it can be very messy. Because people, humans, are trying to attempt to lead this. And humanity and people don't care the pastor, don't care the church, don't care the name, don't care leadership. We are humans and we are fallible and we make a mess of things. But I've seen all that. I've, I wish I didn't see all that. All right, we've all seen the messiness, but also I've seen the beauty. It's both and. Wonderful and amazing and complicated and messy. And we all have our stories. I understand that this morning. We all are coming in with different experiences, different lived experiences. And I don't want to discredit that by any means. But again, I just want to go through Scripture and see what God designed it to be. Well, it's easy to pour out like, mm, 
I've seen all the places we haven't done that. But what does God design it to be? And how might, me, how might we continue to live into that? Even though it's been messy and complicated, it's also beautiful. And I'm aware that many, even more these days, it seems like, than in a long time, want to give up on her. And what I mean by her, and why I say that, is the church in the Bible is referred to as the bride of Christ. That's why God cares about it so much. It's not just something flippant. It's literally, we are the bride of Christ. In a relationship with Jesus, attempting to follow him. But again, I know it's, it's messy, it's complicated, and a lot want to give up on her, and have, and I, and I understand that. But what I want to do today is look at what Scripture says and how we may be spurred on to live into God's design. So I got three points. Number one, God designed us to be in community with him. And I, I want us to have this framework before you start talking about, like, church on Sunday mornings, why we do it. I want us to be reminded, even from the get-go, in the garden, Adam and Eve, if you read the story, it's pretty incredible because God creates everything. He is the creator God. He made the moon and the sun and the stars and every plant and every animal. I mean, he made the solar system. Unbelievable. And then he makes man. Everything is good until this point. When he makes man. And then what happens? Ooh. It is not good for this man to be alone. That is a true statement. Many, it'll preach today. Not good for anybody to be alone. Especially men. But God said everything is very good. Like think about that. The Milky Way and galaxies and the earth is turning. And if we were like a foot closer to the sun, we'd burn up. And a foot farther away and we'd freeze. I mean, it's unbelievable. And God made man in the garden and everything's perfect. And he's like, oh boy, I got to fix this. This is not good. What does he do? He makes woman. Relationship. Community. Instant community and instant relationship. From the very beginning, God designed us to not be alone. Again, then sin enters in and he messes everything up and perfect relationship is broken between humanity and God. It's all messed up because of sin. And we're still living in that. We're messed up. We sin against each other. We hurt each other. The word is a mess. But it wasn't designed that way. And even though it's still a mess, that doesn't negate God's design. Doesn't mean like, well, it's too messy to have friends because all my friendships have ended. That doesn't mean don't have friends. It just means, unfortunately, we live in a broken world. But God still wants to fight for relationships. Again, that is the cross in a nutshell. A relationship was broken between us and our Father, and Jesus was sent to repair it. Relational God. God designed to be with us in community. It started in the garden. We see it in the cross. But even before that, if you read the Old Testament, right, like, let's just say the story of Exodus. Right, God's people are imprisoned in Egypt. They're enslaved for 400 years. You know the story, Prince of Egypt. You've seen the movie. Right, Moses, let my people go. God, through plagues and through all kinds of things, through the parting of the Red Sea, frees his people, and they're in the wilderness, and they wander from some 40 years. And that's a whole story, and we did a whole sermon series on that one uh, long ago. But if you read the book of Exodus again, you realize not long, what happens is, is like there's these chapters, like over and over and over, there's chapters written about the construction of a thing called a tabernacle. It's a big tent, but it was really ornate. Everyone with skills, carpenters and, you know, those that would sew, and there's gems, and I mean, you, you name it, it's like seven chapters of detailed construction of their tabernacle. Not only of the construction of this thing called the tabernacle, but where it was supposed to be placed in the midst of the people of God. And the purpose of the tabernacle 
was so that the people of God could meet with and experience the person and the presence of God. God made a really big deal about it. They're wandering in the wilderness. They're messing up. They're sinning. They're rebelling. And in that moment, God is like, I want you to be reminded that it's really important to me that you gather with me regularly and I'm in the center of all that you do. It was a very visual representation of God's people being in God's presence in community. And again, it was stressing the importance of gathering corporately to worship. This was like a huge part of Israel's life in the desert. And then, finally, fast forward quite a bit, but finally we get, they get into the promised land where they finally reach and establish God's new nation where they're meant to be, Right? And then God said, you know what, the tabernacle was good, but it was a lot of work, and it was kind of temporary, so now I want you to make what's called the temple. It's a permanent structure in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, where this is going to be the main place where my people come to worship me, and be with me, and my people experience my presence and my power. Right, and there's the first one built by Solomon, detailed in 1 Kings 5 and 6, And then there's a second one after it was destroyed. And then the third, most elaborate, was built by King Herod just before the time of Jesus. Right, the the temple and the tabernacle, both this permanent and temporary structure, were places where the people of God would regularly meet with the presence and power of God. So again, from like Genesis all the way through the Old Testament, thousands of years to the time of Jesus, what do we see? God was like, it's really important that my people meet together in community. We see this from the very beginning throughout all the people of God's life leading up to the time of Jesus. They met together in community around the presence of God in a physical location. So like going to church isn't a new concept. At all. We've just adapted to our culture and our time. And I think for the most part, people have just adapted and tried to manage the best they can. But going to church isn't a new concept. But again, the story doesn't stop there. But we see throughout scripture, there's this common thread of relationship and community and corporate worship. And like people are always gathering on the Lord's day. Where they're always gathering together to worship the creator God, Yahweh. But then my my second point here, not only is the first point true, but number two, in the time of Jesus, right after, is that we have this beautiful picture. God gives us the example of the early church to model ourselves after. Because again, it would be really hard if we were just left with like temple and tabernacle life. I don't think we'd ever be able to like try to figure that out. But there's actually a very, it's an easier picture to model after, which we see in Acts chapter 2. But before I read the text that I asked you to open up to, I want to remind us and and remind us and uh, help us remember the context of the time. So the beginning of Acts is just post Jesus dying, rising from the dead, and now ascending to heaven. It's just post this time. And so the church, the followers of Jesus, are left to do this thing without the physical representation of Jesus. But again, these followers in the beginning of Acts were the closest to Jesus that any of us could be. For many, they had been with him side by side. They had ate at the same table. They had slept next to him in the same house. They had walked with him for three and a half years. They saw him raise people from the dead and heal people of every sickness. And the blind were seen and the deaf were hearing. And he was turning water into wine. And he was walking on water. And he was the Sermon on the Mount. And he was teaching and teaching and talking about the kingdom of God. And their minds were blown. They're absolutely being transformed by the presence and power of God in the person of Jesus. 
So you have to remember and then, and what the, how they must have felt when Jesus physically left them. Like, I get it why they were in despair when Jesus died on the cross, because they're like, what are we going to do now? But then they see him rise from the dead. He ascends to heaven. 500 witnesses see him alive again. Every th- hope is restored, but then he ascends to heaven. He still leaves. Even though he rises from the dead, he leaves them. But what, what then do they do? What happens in Acts chapter 2? The upper room. In Jerusalem, it says that 120 people, what did they do? They gathered physically together to pray, to worship, to call upon God. What happens? The Holy Spirit falls upon the church for the first time, and it fills the church. The Holy Spirit fills fills believers, right? The Holy Spirit being the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, comes in, and now believers are empowered to live for Christ by the power of Christ, and literally God's presence is in them and with them now. So it's not just the God of the universe and the creator God that's in the temple or the tabernacle. It wasn't just the person of Jesus who they were with, and now every believer, once they give their self to the Lord and believe that Christ Christ was raised from the dead and confess that he's Lord, are filled now with the Holy Spirit. God graciously and miraculously gives his church his Holy Spirit, gathered together physically in person, praying. Again, the presence of God was once again with the people of God, this time in the form of the Holy Spirit. So after that happens, in Acts chapter 2, look at what these group of Christians, a.k.a. the early church, this is the first time the church was the church. Acts 2, 42 through 47, what did these believers do? It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone that was in need, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they also broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here's what I want to point out, and it's really important. Oh, can you go back? Sorry. These people were the closest people to the person of Jesus that had ever been. They were as freshly filled with the Holy Spirit as anyone had ever been. It would only make sense to be like, this is exactly what the church should be. Every church, including ours, everywhere in the world... Has, has, but should continue to go, it doesn't matter what the sound sounds like. It doesn't matter the lights. It doesn't matter where you meet. If you have your own building, your portable church, all that stuff doesn't matter. It really doesn't. This is what matters. Do this all the time exactly the same. In your own context, in your own culture, in your own language. Do it. You see where I'm going here. Like this is this beautiful model, and it's actually pretty simple. We complicate church so much. Church is not supposed to be complicated. What'd they do? They just gathered together, and they ate food, and they prayed, and they worshiped, and they talked about Jesus. You're like, that sounds so good. I'm like, yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. And unfortunately, right, because of humanity and people leading churches and all of the junk that's happened, like, some of us are like, that is so far what I've experienced, and I'm so sorry. Because that is so, not, you're, whatever you lived through is not that. I'm so sorry, because that's what it's supposed to be. And what I also want to point out is there's two things that is said here. They still kept meeting in the temple courts. Where am I? Where are you? Oh, yes. Verse 46. That means the large gathering, the temple courts. This could hold like 3,000 people at the time. This is like a big church service. That's okay. Big church is okay. They did that. 
It gets messy, big church, but it's okay. They did it. But then they didn't just stop there. What else they do? They didn't just go to church to a big church service. They also went to each other's homes, small gatherings. Big and small are both important. They're different re- There's different purposes, though. One size does not fit all. You understand what I'm saying now? Both had fellowship. Both had teachings. Both had communion. Both were worshiping. But God met them, and God moved, and the church grew. And again, as fo- again, so, so when you hear us always talk about Sunday mornings and Ohana groups, you know why we're trying to push both those? Because we're trying to live under that vision. We don't do it perfectly. No church does. We make a mess. So does everyone. You know what I mean? Like, but our heart is reality. It's like, why, why do they always talk about these Ohana groups? That. Why do they talk about coming to church every Sunday? That. Why do they have communion every Sunday? That. Why do we worship? That. I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm saying we're just attempting to try to live into this. And that's why we do gather on Sundays. That's why we do have Ohana groups, right? That's why we have kids' church. That's why we have youth group. It's because we're so, our heart as a church, just so you know, is to try to attempt in our context to live into this vision of Acts 2. Because I think they had the closest to the perfect, I mean, they had the closest to the perfect church. You know there was a mess. You know there was drama. You absolutely know they did. But do, they're pretty, do you see that part where they sold their houses and everything they had when they saw people in need? That's radical. But again, that's actually normal. We say radical, they're like, that's normal. See that? That's crazy. Okay, that's point two. Point three. Do we have it? Nobody knows. We are met by God through one another when we gather together. I'll unpack it, but we're met by God through one another when we gather together. Okay, so this is what I mean by that. Although the things we do on Sundays, large gatherings, or small groups, like our Ohana groups, they're important. They're of utmost importance. I will say church is more. It, it absolutely needs to be more than just worship and the teaching of the Word of God. And this is why I say that. Throughout the New Testament, there is a huge emphasis of God working through each other for the benefit of one another. A huge emphasis. There are, are also huge emphases in teaching the word of God and corporate worship. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of the New Testament, a lot of the Bible, is talking about how we, as individuals, as part of this big corporate church, that we're supposed to serve and love each other through our giftings and through the Holy Spirit working with one another on Sundays and in small groups. This is what I mean. I want to read you a list. There's like 30 things in this list. But it's pretty powerful when you break it down. I want to read you a list of all the ways the New Testament instructs us to love and serve one another. First to the church, inside the church, and then also to those outside the church that do not know Jesus. These are all, maybe you've heard this before, it's pretty powerful, but it's all the one another verses. It's all the ways that like all of us are called. This is not just a pastor, like leadership of a church thing. This is an all member ministry. This is the whole point of the church here. Okay, here we go. This is a list of all the ways the New Testament says they're supposed to love and serve each other. Number one, love one another. John 13, 34. We have this list. No problem if we don't. Or if we don't have a, we don't have the list. <gasps> no problem. Okay. Okay, just, to, just hear it. Well, I'll send it later. No problem. Okay, just let it wash over you as I say it. Love one another, John 13, 34. 16 times this comes up. Okay. Be devoted to one another, Romans 12, 20. Excuse me, 12, 10. Honor one another above yourselves. Ooh, that's a good one. 
Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 12 also. Live in harmony with one another. Also Romans 12, 16. Build up one another. Romans 14 and 1 Thessalonians 5. Be like-minded towards one another, Romans 15, 5. Accept one another, Romans 15, 7. Admonish one another, Romans 15, Colossians 3. Greet one another, Romans 16. Care for one another, 1 Corinthians 12. Serve one another, Galatians 5, 13. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2. Forgive one another, Ephesians 4, Colossians 3. Be patient with one another. Ephesians 4, Colossians 3. Speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4, 15 and 25. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Ephesians 4, 32. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Ephesians 5, 19. Submit to one another. Ephesians 5, 1 Peter 5. Consider others better than yourselves. If, you just, if we just did that, the world would be unbelievably better. Consider others better than yourself, Philippians 2.3. Look to the interests of one another, Philippians 2.4. Bear with one another, Colossians 2, Colossians 3.13. Teach one another, Colossians 3.16. Comfort one another, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. Encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Exhort one another, Hebrews 3.13. Stir up one another towards love and good works, Hebrews 10. Show hospitality to one another, 1 Peter 4, 9. Employ the gifts that God has given you for the benefit of one another, 1 Peter 4, 10. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. That also would change the world, 1 Peter 5, 5. Pray for one another, James 5, 16. And lastly, confess your faults to one another, James 5, 16. The reason I say this, the reason why I like said all that, is that the church gathering is meant to be, for many things, more than just worship and the word of God. It's for the church and every member to pray for one another and encourage one another and to serve one another, to give each other prophetic words. I mean, Sundays is supposed to be like this radical time. Maybe it's normal, but we worship, we pray, and everyone is like meeting each other. We're hospitable. We're looking out for the interests of each other, seeing how you're doing. Can you imagine if everyone was that mindful every Sunday? It would be like the most loving. You guys already do this pretty well. I'm just saying, think of that. If we were all like, when I come to church on Sunday, I want to care for my church. I want to serve them. I want to submit to them. I want to look out for their interests. And you went around the room with this. But if everyone did it, then you would be cared for too. Does that make sense? Because you're like, oh my gosh, I just need to receive because it was such a hard week. I know. So if you care for them and they care for you, everyone's cared for this is why it's, this is how it is. And so that's why, again, I think it's a good intention, but that's why regularly gathering as God's people is so important. It's more than just the sermon. It's more than just the worship, right? Ideally, like I'm just going to say ideally. I'm not calling anyone out. Hear me, hear me, please hear me. This is ideal world. You just have to hear me with love. Hear me. We all come early. We all stay late. Why? It's not so you can catch the first worship song. I want you to, but I want you to talk to someone and they, they, God uses you through them into their life. Right? Because like, I, I know that church is supposed to be all this stuff. Yes, it's the teaching of the word. Yes, it's worship. Yes, it's the prayer meeting. But a huge portion is actually supposed to be all of us loving each other. And serving each other. God wants to use us. And God wants to minister to us through each other. That's wild. But that's true. And, you know, it's not, I mean, it's more recently, I think. But for a lot of people, like, I mean, everyone knows these type of people. I get it. But they're Christians and they're like, I don't need church. I can meet and follow Jesus on my own. Mm, that's partially true, but in a big way, it's not. You, um, the only way I can describe it is this, and, and, and I want to be sensitive to where people are at, but the only way I can describe it is this. It's like eating one type of food that will keep you alive, 
but perhaps it isn't giving you a well-rounded diet. So it, it, this type of diet will keep you alive for a time. But what will happen? You will become vitamin deficient in certain areas, and it will affect your overall health and well-being. But in the meantime, you're like, I'm good. Yeah, you're good for now. But you will become very imbalanced and unhealthy if you only do one thing when you're supposed to do everything. In balance, in health, like proper diet. So in the same way for the Christian, if you decide to stop corporately gathering in large and small settings with other believers, even if you have like the best podcast routine and the best devos and the best worship playlist, in a sense, you're becoming vitamin deficient in our walk and relationship with God and your growth will be stunted and your transformation will be missed apart from being with others. You're not encouraged, you're not exhorted, you're not cared for, no one's patient with you, no one's bearing your, you're missing out. You know what I mean? You know, you know what I mean? And again, I understand there's a season and people go through it sometimes and they're hurt for churches and they need time. I get that. I'm not negating that. But I also want to call out and pray for healing and restoration for Christians, right, that would come back into the fold, whatever church it may be, to experience all that God made the church to be. So here's my application, and here's where I'll land the plane. We are not meant and cannot walk with Jesus on our own. We can't. It's not even God's design. Like, it's not even close to what it's meant to be. It's God's plan that we actually do this together. Well, is it so messy? It's like, yeah, I totally know, and I'm super sorry. Ah, oh, but people are so hard to deal with. I know, it's the hardest thing on the planet. Life would be so easy without people. It's true, though. You just had a task, and you had to do it, and you're all on your own. A lot less trauma. Again, that is not the way of Jesus. That is not the way of God. That is... Some of you in here that are like conflict avoidant are like, what is this sermon about? Join the club. I hate drama too. I hate it. But a lot of times, the gospel is played most in the drama of our lives. If there wasn't drama, there'd be maybe no opportunity to forgive. If you weren't backstabbed, there'd be no opportunity to extend mercy. You get what I mean? The gospel can be displayed most powerfully in the midst of relational drama. I actually didn't have that in my notes. I think that's from the Holy Spirit, so receive it as that. Because it's true. As much as I don't want you to go through all that drama, I think God uses it for his glory and his kingdom. I think he can. My exhortation to all of us is that we just view church differently. I say it all the time, but hey, are you going to go to a church? Or, did, or are you going to go to church today? Are you going to attend church? And I'm like, ooh, even the way I said that made it a show. Even the way I said that made that a one-sided interaction. Right? Because that, that we're just used to that. Just this program, this church program is at 10, and I kind of just like receive. And I'm like, ooh, I think we missed out on all this like one another's. So my hope and my prayer is that maybe we would just change our mindset that like what, what church is and that we value it perhaps more than we used to. And not only do we like attend, but we actually think about like participation. Like, instead of just coming to receive, we do that also, but we're like, ooh, how does God want me to, to use me today with the rest of these people? Like, God, use me. God, allow my life to be a blessing to those in this room on Sunday mornings. Right? Like, that's church. And what's crazy is, if you look at it through the lens of Scripture, we actually need each other. Like, I need you and you need me. And you could say that about everyone that goes to the church. 
Because who knows how God wants to use you on any given time. And my heart and my prayer is that we would intentionally com- commit. Maybe, to, maybe it's more consistently. Maybe it's more regularity. Maybe it's more consi- uh, just more often large and small gatherings. And I don't say that just merely to get more people here on a Sunday morning because it feels better. But it would. But I don't just say that just for fun or any religious obligation. I do it out of care and well-being for all of us. Because I know what it's meant to be. Like church on a Sunday morning or on a Hana group is supposed to be more encounters with God. More time hearing his voice. voice, More ways God meets us through his people. The more you enter into a community that is striving to be like this, the more you'll feel known, the more you'll feel supported and cared for. And here's the truth. If, if any one of us isn't here, we potentially miss out on the way God wants you to bless me and me to bless you. I know for me, I got saved in middle school. You know the reason why I kept going, though? Even more than, like, my friends were going. It was, there was people at the doors, I'm serious, of my youth group. And there was one leader in particular. And the very first time he met my name, he knew my name, he remembered my name, he smiled, he asked me about my life. Just like, hey, how was your baseball game this week? I'm like, you remember me and you remember my baseball game? It was just a single person. It wasn't the sermons and it wasn't the worship. It was the people of God just caring for me and knowing me. It was like, and so for years, I would call it like the say hello ministry. We have a hospitality aloha team now. God bless them. But there is power in just someone knowing you and like asking you like, hey, I I remember last week you told me about, like, your job interview. How'd it go? I don't know about you, but, like, you feel so known. You feel so supported and you're encouraged. Someone sends you a text, like, hey, man, I remember that, like, hard meeting was on Friday. How'd it go? You're like, dude, people know me. Like, this is, on a small scale, what God desires for us to be as the church. And so that's why, As messy and as complicated as the church can be, and I know she can be really messy and really painful, I still contend for her. I still fight for her because I know God's design. And I know in the midst of all that, she still is meant to be beautiful and wonderful and life-giving in a time where we gather and meet with the person of Jesus through worship, through prayer, through the word of God, but through each other as well. So I just wanted to leave that here as a time to just sit in that and as we worship, just be with the Lord. And perhaps, when, however God spoke to you, now would be the time where we respond. Whether that's in prayer and worship and taking communion, like this is a time of response to come before the Lord with how he spoke to us and say, God, I want more of that, or I want to be used, or I want to receive, or man, I want to be more committed to who you are and what you're doing. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to enter in a time of worship and prayer and communion. God, thank you that you are a God of relationships. You are a God that cares about community and relationships and how we're doing. And not only that, is that you use us powerfully in each other's lives. And God, I pray that none of us would miss out on this. God, I pray that we would be more used by you in each other's lives than ever before. I pray that we would um, really see this beautiful and wonderful vision that you lay out in Scripture, and I pray that we would live into that. God, I pray against living, doing it out of any religious obligation or out of, like, some kind of feeling forced. I I pray that we would do it out of, like, seeing your love and care as a father for his kids in it. So the way I read this, Lord, is like, dude, you're, you're our dad, and like, you just want us to like all be together because 
you want to meet us when we're together way more powerfully than we're, than we're alone. You also want to do it when we're alone, but there is something very special and unique and powerful when the church gathers in the way you want to meet us. And so God, even now in this time of worship, we pray that you would meet us in a powerful way through these songs and through these lyrics. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.